Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I'm under pressure <laughs> uh, because I'm more of a doer than a talker. So if I fumble, uh, please uh, clap for me. <laughs> yeah. So first, a very warm welcome to everybody uh, in this whole product festival, right? Uh, and all our online audiences. Uh, I want to first start by thanking Product School uh, for making this happen and for the audience coming here and allowing me to share my experiences with you. As I said, I'm a doer, so I hopefully uh, it will be worth it. So my name is Shubhayu, and for those who can't pronounce my name, call me Mr. Data. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, and this is how I look like on LinkedIn. A lot have been talked about me. Let's move on from there. I want to uh, talk about some of my fundamental beliefs, which you won't find on LinkedIn. Right? This has been the start of the journey, basically moving from a jack of all trades to a master of all, all things product management. Steve Jobs, he's my hero. Uh, what I like about him is his clarity is his vision, sometimes stubborn vision, if you may think. But that stubbornness comes from an extreme deep understanding of the customer, right? Think of it deeply. All things product management are equally important for us. But who doesn't need data? Who doesn't need hiring? Who doesn't need culture, right? But what segregates a product leader from the rest of the herd? is customer obsession. I never forget that. So I do spend 80% of my time just trying to understand customer and never sell anything to the customer. Right? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So when this first opportunity came to me, I thought I'll have to make a dent in the universe. Right? Sounds familiar. So I thought that why not uh, talk about the pressures of prioritization, all the stakeholder disagreements, and all the scope changes, right? How many of you can relate to this problem? Quick, quick show of hands, right? Super. So that's a testimony that frameworks don't work, right? <laughs> so, and the reason is that product and payroll is every employee's business, like it or not. Everybody has an opinion about it, right? So the sooner we get to terms with it, the better it is. So what I did was, in my quest for excellence, I also tried ChatGPT. So how do I say no confidently? It says be assertive. And if I'm assertive, you know what follows, right? So I want to share with you how we solve this problem in Tier. I want to first introduce Tier Mobility to all of you. If you haven't already used our products, uh, yeah, you already saw uh, our MJ using our scooters. So we are a sustainability company. We are on the mission to change mobility for good. We are in uh, 31 countries. Let me read it out from the slide. So we are in 31 countries, 560 cities, 24 plus million customers in four years. How does this infectious growth happen? Right? So this is product-led growth in reality. Right? So I'm going to share with you some of the uh, mechanisms that we use beyond any frameworks which don't work right? uh, to enable such infectious growth. And it starts with, it starts with product-led growth. It starts with the org design. So as a product leader, I am responsible, accountable, and so is my team, responsible and accountable for the p &L performance of the company. Pressure. Right? But then we participate in the forecasting, in the budgeting. We take the lead not finance, right? And we are held accountable for the performance of the company. So we have to go beyond slides. We have to go beyond talking about it into practical execution, and that's what I'm going to share with you, right? About what are the working mechanisms that we have put in place that can build such a growth. And it's always about saying no. It's always about saying no. Saying no to the thousand things so that we focus on the right things, right? And by the way, I'm a doer if you like it, so. A little round of applause will help me. So it all begins with him, right? 1997, still so valid. 
So there are only simple things, focus and simplicity. That's what we do in Q4, right? So we begin with who is our customer and who is not, and why do they care? Then we move to simplicity, what to simplify, where and when to simplify, and don't forget the, the people, right? Because as product leaders, we need to bring all our folks, all our stakeholders, including our vendors, on the same journey, right? If there is no alignment, then we have a problem. So I'll begin with the Q4 exercise that I was talking about, right? Is we focus on who is our customer and who is not, right? Sometimes people will say begin with the why, I say begin with the who, right? And focus can be scary. It can be really scary. Ask me, when I go for a buffet dinner, I make sure I pick up everything on my way, right? <laughs> and what happens? I end up eating a lot of things I don't like, right? And I end up wasting a lot of food. So if you ask me at the end of the day, was it pleasurable? Probably not. Then I wish that what was value for money? I wish that I would have known exactly those three delicious items that I like. I would have picked them up in abundance, ate them, and yet have time for some chocolate dessert. <laughs> that's the power of focus for you. And that's why I always say that you have to focus on your Pareto customers. Those 20% customers who will unlock 80% of your growth ambitions. Whatever your growth ambition is, it could be profitability, it could be revenue, it could be moving to a new region, adding a new product line, whatever is your strategic growth ambition of the company, the corporate strategy, align yourself to that. Bring in those 20% of users, power users, who are going to unlock that 80% of value. Identify them. And then, do deep interviews with them. One hour at least, deep interviews with them. Never sell solutions. Try and understand where they're coming from, what they do before, what they do after. A lot has been talked about. I won't bore you with those details, right? But it's important as product leaders, I personally also go through each and every question that's there, right? And alongside that, that's a qualitative analysis. Do a quantitative analysis, AI, cluster analysis, so on and so forth, to understand the in-app behaviors of the customers and get to the point of what they don't tell you, right? So with that knowledge, then we move in Q4 itself to what is known as a strategy canvas. So here we have all the values or all the needs, all the problems, whatever you call it, that the customers or those segments of, or those target segments really want on a scale of zero to 10. We picked two and I'll show you why. This is, on top of this, we overlay where our strengths are. It's important. And we find out that in certain areas, we are actually fulfilling the need to an optimum. Five areas. Now, email, uh, and we then specifically choose not to build or develop new products in this area or new experiences. And I know some of you are going like, what about wow? What about delight, right? How do I build in delight? Why not build that 5X growth? Well, let me quote an example and I'll read from here. iPhone 14 Pro Max and Samsung S22. I'm gonna compare these two. We know who the market leader is. I'm not gonna break that debate on <laughs> you know, Apple versus uh, Samsung, right? But iPhone has 14 megapixels of front camera and 18 in the back, in the rear, versus Samsung is 40 and 108. So three times more feature packed. Yet, as a customer, I bet you would say which is the winner and you know, which provides a pleasurable experience. So one of the things that I'm really passionate about is that if the need is basic, right? If it's just a basic need, jobs to be done, then there comes a point of diminishing return. As a product leader, we need to know that point. Don't keep on wowing the customer everywhere. If you want to please everybody, you please no one. Right? So that's one tip for you. Moving on. We have the competition. Now, 
this is a massive generalization. Don't don't get to 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 worked up with it. This is a massive generalization. In reality, we plot all our competitions different, each in individual competition, and plot their strength. Take this as an aggregation, right? And we then see what is the strength of the competition and where I should not pick up battles. And there, I find two areas. Now, you may ask, okay, why still not fight them in these two areas? Why do you bail out? The reason could be multiple. The reason could be that I may not be able to drive a lot of uh, huge customer experience. I may only be able to drive marginal customer experience, right? So I know that. Or it could be that we know that the competition will make a move, right? So based on those things, we decide we will not. There are other use cases also. For example, that you know that technology may be very hard. Technology to move this problem is in its infancy. So we know that we will have to come up with hacks and a lot of work has to be done. So that could be another reason. Uh, two other points I want to touch on is it may not be our strength also, right? And we need to play to our strengths. And last, this need may be a general need for all segments. It's not unique to my VIP segment or my strategic customer. So that's something, those are some of the reasons why we decide not to fight that battle. Then comes where do we pick up the battle? So we selected two areas, right? And why? So the first is need number six. We, we selected this because this need is just not a very practical need. It is in the hierarchy of needs. It is at a self-actuation or much higher need. Higher need, emotional needs, customer willingness to pay is much more. If you keep chasing the practical needs, megapixel, you will keep doing that, right? But the emotional need that Apple cracked was that you don't want to click a picture. You want to upload a picture in Instagram. Oh, so after a certain point, it's diminishing return because it takes a lot of time. It's a heavy file, right? So those are the things you need to really get into. So that's the need number six. Then the need number 10. We picked this because it's a unique need to my strategic customer. The non-strategic segment may not have, this need may not appeal to them. And why that's important? Because if I have to bottle my strategic customer, right, then I need to understand what differentiates them and what is the additional things beyond the practical things everybody is looking for. And that's why we select here, right? And another thing, as a tip that I always kind of do then, is how do we incentivize the non-strategic segment to behave according to these needs? So we always incentivize customers who want to behave in this way, right? So you do this, I give you this. So in that, we are actually moving the needle of the non-strategic segment to move into the strategic space. And I'm creating a broader group of strategic customers that will give me high CLTV, right? So these are some of the reasons why we do this. Once, so basically don't keep adding value sporadically here and there, it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, add 5x value in very focused areas where you will be able to compete, and that is competitive advantage. So we know that we are at least 5x times better than our competition in these two areas, and that is my product positioning, right? Next, it comes with, we need to align. Ah, strategic alignment. Yeah, I feel you. Why not stakeholder engagement? Why I choose strategic alignment? It's because, ask a married couple. They'll tell you, sometimes there's too much engagement, less alignment. So what if, what if you agree with your stakeholders on first principles before the year starts that these are the 
building blocks, these are the principles. Any day daily transaction happens, daily decision making, I always refer back to that contract. Hey, I married you last year and this was my contract. Yeah. Right? And one of those is, as a, we, in the Q4 itself, all that I said, we discuss and align on the segment we will not target, segment we will target. On the product positioning, as I mentioned, which are the clear areas, we'll hit the ball out of the park. And then we open up something known as a product intake mechanism. So when every stakeholder, including finance, anybody has an idea, there's a clear ticket, raise it, and it'll come to my backlog and we'll analyze. Right? Here, um, again, should not do this in presentation, I'm told. Don't go back, okay? So, but again, I'm a doer, right? I can get away with things. So, <laughs> in product intake mechanism, a few things. I always encourage my stakeholder, please don't give me solution. Tell me the problems you're wanting to solve for the customers, right? Otherwise, it's not a customer-obsessed company, it's a sales company, right? And one from my experience, um, you will see that through this process, you're able to actually filter out 80 to 90% of the ideas that come in, right? Because they don't fit into your strategic decision making, right? Remember those eight areas that we chose not to build, right? So that's where you can cut down on 80 to 90%. That's like saying no very nicely. Okay. Now, with that intake mechanism, what do we still do in Q4? It's a long Q4. Right? is we plot all those ideas that we internally have and that has come from stakeholders into this product impact canvas. Now, arguably, you would say that if there is no development work happening, no enhancement of the UX, then still the, the product would sell, right? as long as you keep your services on and you know KTLO stuff, keep the lights on, right? Uh, so that's our baseline. That's what we call in the forecasting process as our baseline. Anything we build on top of that should have clear revenue targets and goals, right? So you'd see the first one uh, here, okay, is Team Cool, right? They have been assigned the problem ABC, right? And the target is, 5% of acquisition. So we believe that if we do ABC, we will acquire 5% of more customers. This is based on historic data, gut feeling, whatever you call. And this will give me a total uplift, now that I explained baseline and uplift, of 3.8 million. We'll be rich someday. And this is a strategic area, right? So it's important for us to build it. And it will give me EBITDA, et cetera. Then I move on to the second one, which is same cool team, but doing X, Y, Z. And you would ask me here, why are they working on a non-strategic area? You just said you will not work. But think of things like chat GPT. When a disruptive technology comes and throws, the, you, know, throws you off the rail in five days, right? That means, or when the entire competition has upped the game, Right? That means then if you go back to the value curve or the strategy curve, the customer expectation would have increased. Right? And that is when we also decide to work on non-strategic areas. Yeah? So that's Q4. Pressure. After that, what we do on a monthly basis, or a daily or a weekly basis, is rapid experimentation. Remember, I assumed 5% based on similar projects, et cetera, et cetera, and that's an assumption. But if we achieve 5% of acquisition, definitely because we do the forecasting based on our finance model, correct? So finance can assure you if 5% is guaranteed, 3.8 million is guaranteed, right? So question is, is it five or is it two? Rapid experimentation. Bring it, make it as hacky as possible, but 
Business is speed. Timing is everything. Right? Do visit of ours, do prototype. As far as I am concerned, draw on a piece of paper and experiment, right? But it shouldn't take more time. That's important. That's why, and then if you revise your assumption, that will be revised here, correct? Next, the product intake mechanism is always there. So new ideas are always flowing in. 80% of them are automatically segregated out because of first principles, right? And then we align the stakeholder consistently. This is where we do the monthly business reviews, right? So that we update the impact canvas and do the business reviews constantly with the stakeholder. Two things I want to add here, which previous speakers have fantastically covered, so I won't be elaborate on it. One is continuous discovery. So remember, we did the whole exercise of customer understanding in Q4, not that I don't revisit it again. Right? As I said, I like to spend most of my time with the customer. So we revisit that every time to understand whether the needs are changing, correct? Or, you know, all of that. And then we definitely need to adapt this one. And this is the moment where I fumble, right? So I was expecting a clap. But. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Back on track. So when there is this constant alignment with the customer, and I want to, I want to kind of explain it with a metaphor. Right? So customer relationship is, is like somewhat like a partnership. Yeah? Or I can say it's like my relationship with my spouse. It's that deep. So in the initial honeymoon period, there's a lot of curiosity and a lot of understanding. Right? But the curiosity drains down because what's more to understand. I know everything. And then the miss is in front of the understanding. Right? If we know that as leaders, consciously, and it has happened. People take an example of Nokia, taking customers for granted. We are the best. Overnight, gone. Right? If we know that constantly, we would be as curious, and I think, pardon me, 20 or 23 years, you know, I think we have a very good relationship with my wife. So, uh, so that's important. If stickiness is retention, then curiosity is the glue, right? Your PM's curiosity is definitely the glue, so please don't forget that. Quick recap, besides the tip of wearing red glasses, it always says, nice to say no, red. Okay, it resonated with somebody. <laughs> These are your first, this is a quick recap of the top five, right? So we first do a who. Who is my customer? Most importantly, who is not, right? Whenever somebody says, I want to do this, I say, okay, what do we not do, right? So who is my customer, who is not? Segment, target. Then, why? Why? There are so many whys that the customer cares about. What is my product positioning? Third, intake process. Bring in everything. As I said, 80% will not fit your strategic area, so you have clear goals. Those 20% that remain, rapidly experiment. Be curious. Align stakeholders. And you will nail it. And I want to end by saying thank you to two group of people, without which, whom I would not have been able to utter a single word here. One, product school guys, back end. There's a lot of work, a lot of hard work. Yeah, I think we should appreciate that. You know. Not done yet. My team, if they did not deliver on the metrics that I was able to proudly show to you, I would not have able to be even stand here, right? So please, a round of applause for them. Awesome. And oh, oh. I'll finish with Steve Jobs. Come okay. On, come on, come no, on, come really. On. Oh. I'll finish with Steve Jobs. That was awkward. That was awkward. So, no, 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 it's not awkward. Super. I'm a doer. Oh, they have given me the license. Are we, should I go back down? No, it's okay. 30 seconds. So, All it's right. important, it's important to say. I'll point for you, I'll point. Yep. It's important to say that what he said is, I'm proud of all the things that I haven't done, right? 
And innovation, innovation is saying no to a thousand things. I'll end with focus is about saying no. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.